These are coronavirus test kits being flown by Chopper to the Grand Princess cruise ship after reports of a suspected outbreak of COVID-19. I was worried mainly because my parents are elderly and my mom has asthma, so yeah, I'm very worried if she would get ill, what might happen. Debbie Loftus and her parents are among the 2,400 passengers circling more than 60 miles off San Francisco, not allowed to disembark. Just hours ago, Vice President Mike Pence gave the results. 21 individuals on the Grand Princess testing pilot. Among those were 19 crew members and two passengers. Right now, it's just Those that need to be quarantined will be quarantined. Those that require additional medical attention will receive it. Outside the San Francisco hospital, we're setting up tents to handle any overflow coronavirus patients as the virus wreaks havoc across the country. In the United States, there are hundreds of cases in at least 26 states with at least 17 deaths. Daily life has been disrupted. The wildly popular Austin Festival South by Southwest now canceled with dozens of other large gatherings. And now a wave of school closures. Classes are canceled here. That means no classes, no practices, no after-school activities. And many employees are being told to work from home, including everyone at Apple headquarters in Cupertino, California, and Microsoft. In Hollywood, the release of a new James Bond movie, No Time to Die, postponed for eight months. Where's the Wilson? President Trump visited the Centers for Disease Control and insisted the federal government has the coronavirus outbreak under control. The head of the CDC agreed. At the present time, the general risk to the American public remains low. The hardest hit area is Washington State, where there have been more than 80 cases and at least 14 deaths. Seattle's iconic Pike Place Market, normally bustling with tourists and shoppers, virtually deserted yesterday. It's like a ghost town. The epicenter is here. Life Care Center in Kirkland, where at least 10 people have died. Families are outraged at the lack of response. Pat Herrick told us after she learned her mother died, she got a second full phone call. She said, I just want to check in with you and let you know that your mother's doing fine, that she doesn't have a temperature. And I said, my mom died at 3.30 this morning. And she was like, oh my God, you know, that wasn't in the chart. with one of the patients who died from the virus and hasn't been tested for the virus since life here says she doesn't have symptoms. We're here at the epicenter and I feel like everyone is in panic mode. I think we feel like we're in a black hole here. Tonight, for the first time, we're hearing from a resident inside. Susan Haley has a cough and is waiting for test results. Do I want to leave? Yes, absolutely yes. It's not that the people aren't nice. It's that I don't like being Perhaps. Help for the beleaguered facility is now on the way. Officials there announcing that a team of 30 federal health professionals are being sent. This is like a flu on steroids. On the other side of the country, the virus is quickly spreading in the New York City area. I'm not urging calm. I'm urging reality. I'm urging a factual response as opposed to an emotional response. There are at least 44 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in New York State, with most of them linked to a Westchester County lawyer who's still hospitalized in the ICU. About 4,000 people now under quarantine in New York State. The epidemic started in China, in Wuhan. That city has now been on lockdown for two months. It's 11 million inhabitants, mostly out of sight. Streets deserted, public transportation almost non-existent. But there is encouraging news. New infections in China seem to be slowing down. Health officials credit China's strict quarantine. But around the world, the virus is spreading rapidly. We are now on the verge of reaching 100,000 confirmed cases. The visual impact is dramatic. Iconic sites around the globe now empty. This is Mecca in Saudi Arabia before and now. To the Spanish steppes in Rome normally crowded with tourists, 
now empty. And Beijing's forbidden city, once packed, now seemingly desolate. The rapid spread of the virus also impacting the global economy. From toys to clothing to gardening supplies, companies across the country rely on Chinese factories now shut down by the outbreak. About 85% of our products have something in them from China. The great majority of uh, goods in bridal are manufactured in China. Things are taking longer than ever. It is what I call an economic pandemic, and that is it's global in scope, and our efforts to contain the virus and stop the spread of it means shutting down factories, shutting down schools. The consequences have been devastating, especially for travel. The airlines anticipating losses of more than $113 billion in sales as travel and hotel bookings plunge. Uncertain times are driving some to extreme measures. Austin-based Mira Safety says their military-grade gas masks and hazmat suits are in high demand. Regular people who are looking for ways to protect themselves in case this becomes a much bigger threat. The reality, we don't need gas masks. We don't need hazmat suits. When you hear public health officials say, everything's fine, don't panic, I think it runs the risk of being dismissive and actually causing people to panic. It's very important to say, we don't know. When you have this chronic high level of anxiety over, am I going to get infected with coronavirus? You have people going out, trying to stockpile on masks, trying to stockpile on food for months. We just get dry food and also a lot of frozen food. The end of the line for the toilet paper and paper towels is right here. In some parts of the country, endless lines and empty shelves are a new reality. We're seeing price gouging, things like $100 for a bottle of Purell on Amazon. Amazon now vowing to crack down on price gougers, blocking sellers' accounts. This is hysteria. It's only going to make people panic more, controlling the hysteria with sound communication, with facts is going to be very important. What we're seeing now is some things that are done out of fear that might be counterproductive. With the virus continuing to spread, experts say facts, not fear, is the best path forward. We're all in this together. These outbreaks kind of show us our common humanity, and we really do need to fight them as a species. Be sure to tune in to GMA tomorrow for continuing coronavirus coverage. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching. On today's World Insight, South Korea's Defense Ministry says the DPRK has launched two unidentified projectiles off its eastern coast. What does it signal? And Iran has the second deadliest coronavirus outbreak in the world. How will geopolitics affect Iran's containment response? And finally, the scientific community scrambles to find a drug that can cure patients sickened of a new coronavirus. What treatments are in the pipeline? And here is our host, Jan Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. The program is coming to you from Beijing. I am Tian Wei. Let's start with the latest situation on coronavirus in Iran. The country is reporting over 1,500 confirmed cases with dozens of fatalities, making it the worst hit country in the Middle East. Some top Iranian officials were also infected. China's ambassador to Iran says medical supplies and disease control experts from China have started to arrive in the country. Before we get down to the discussion, let's take a look at this. COVID-19 is spreading rapidly in Iran. Iran said Monday that the novel coronavirus had killed 12 more people, raising the country's overall death toll to 66, which is the highest number outside China. The number of confirmed cases leapt by more than 500 from the previous day to a total of 1,501. Several officials, including the Iranian deputy health minister, one of the country's vice presidents, 
and the head of the Security and Foreign Affairs Committee are among those who tested positive. I would like to inform you that I have been infected with the coronavirus. I had a fever yesterday. My first test was positive last night and I have isolated myself. They informed me a few minutes ago that my final test definitely is positive. I'm starting my treatment and my general condition is not bad. Amid concerns over the outbreak, Friday prayers in over two-thirds of the country's provinces have been suspended. Schools in Iran have also closed. Earlier, the Iranian health ministry warned of a relatively difficult week ahead, saying the main peak of the disease is this week and in the coming days. China's ambassadors to Iran said the first batch of medical supplies donated by China has arrived, which includes testing kits and masks. And disease control experts from China have been sent to Iran to help. Iran also received medical supplies from the World Health Organization. A four-person WHO team is expected to arrive in Iran on Monday evening. For more on the COVID-19 outbreak in Iran, we are joined, first of all, in Tehran, Iran, by Gamma Nadari, who is a journalist and political commentator. And Mr. Nadari, welcome to our program. We feel so sorry for the situation in Iran. Tell me more about the latest situation, not only in your capital city, but also around the country. Well, the country is strugg struggling at the moment. As you know, schools, universities, and cultural centers, including major events, have been, uh, have been canceled or shut down. Uh, the, the transport system has been hit the hardest. The small business community has been hit the hardest, especially given the fact that we are very close to the Iranian New Year uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, late March, in, 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 in March 21. So, so the business is down, the mood is down, but of course, as as you know, the officials are working round the clock to contain the virus. We know that about 1,000 people have been affected so far, but the number is going to be bigger than that because these numbers belong to last week and the, the tests what, that were carried out last week. So, so expect a, a, a higher number of deaths and, of course, those who have been infected uh, over the next few days or so. But, but the government, the armed forces, the IRGC are also helping the health ministry officials and the, our top doctors and nurses. Uh, uh, in order to bring the situation under control. Okay. This is the peak week of the, the, the virus infection. Uh, I think it's going to be much, much bigger over the next few days. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Nadare, tell me more about, uh, first of all, the politicians inside your country, the vice president, the vice minister of health, uh, together with several political leaders uh, who claim that they actually were infected when they were at the parliament sessions. Uh, what it is their latest uh, situations? Uh, I think people, uh, the authorities should, should come to their senses and realize that this is a serious situation. We need them to show some seriousness about the situation and at the same time we need them to take responsibility. But how on earth are they going to, to show their responsibilities when they themselves have been infected? That is the hard question that many people are asking here in the capital Tehran that has slowly become a ghost town. Many people are refusing to leave their houses. Many Many schools, uh, as I told you, public places have been closed. We yeah. don't see any kids on the streets anymore. The, 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 the transport system has been hit the hardest. But, but as I told you, we need our officials to, to show that they are taking the situation seriously. If yeah. they don't, I don't think others are going to do the same thing. Mm. Uh, what about the, the Revolutionary Guards? We understand the, the latest news is the Revolutionary Guards are now in the streets of Tehran and they are uh, taking advantage of uh, the, some of the equipment they could use uh, during a, a, a chemical warfare, in fact, uh, the vehicles and also the equipment uh, uh, in order to maintain uh, the order in the streets and also to try to kill the virus as they believe. But meanwhile, you also have the uh, ordinary uh, military people on the streets as well. What is the, you know, the division of labors there in your uh, newly updated system to fight the virus. Could you give us a bigger picture? What exactly is the structure, the mechanism? Well, uh, the, the medical community of this country is not prepared and ready 
to, to, to take up so much pressure when it comes to the containment and, and, and the, the, the cure of the, those who have been affected. We are talking about many provinces and cities and towns. Until yesterday, we had the, the city of Qom as the epicenter, but now it is the capital, Tehran. Obviously, uh, the, the situation has got out of control uh, uh, of the health ministry officials and, and, and the medical community. That's why the armed forces, the IRGC, and the police are also taking matters into their own hands and are helping uh, other responsible authorities in order to d disinfect the affected areas in the capital and uh, beyond. But, but this is not enough. I think we also need the help of the international community. So far, China has been the first to help us. But, and, of, and, of course, the World Health Organization. But mm. when it comes to Europe, I haven't seen any help yet. Uh, Mr. Nader, you brought up a very important question, that is, uh, what about Iran under this very extreme circumstances? What's going to happen from the rest of the world? Uh, what about the WHO Director General, Dr. Tendro's uh, comment recently that uh, we should focus at this moment, uh, in his words, uh, which means, he suggests, that we should focus our attention on fighting against this outbreak rather than so much attention on the uh, bans of goods and also imports to Iran and sanctions against Iran. Uh, what about that comment uh, uh, responded by the general public in Iran? Well, uh, the containment strategy in China helped the international community to buy some time in order to prepare themselves for the spread of the virus, this deadly disease. But lack of it in Iran and at the same time U.S. sanctions and pressures are going to spend it away. So, so authorities uh, of the World Health Organization are uh, completely right to say that Iran needs to see some sanctions lifted, especially when it comes to the, to the purchase of medical equipment, mm -hmm. face masks, and of course, uh, sa sa sanitary items. So far, America refuses to do that. I think the American government, the Trump administration officials, should come to their senses and realize that if Iran becomes the next Wuhan, the next epicenter of the, the virus, I'm afraid they are going to be affected too. Their economies are also going to go down, just as the way Iran's local economy has gone down okay. so far. So they shouldn't think that this is a political issue. They, they shouldn't look at, uh, at their you know, foreign policy as a hostile policy towards Iran. Right now we are talking about public health. Right now we are talking about a global threat to global economy, to global health. And that is going to start from Iran. If they don't help Iran, if they don't lift their sanctions, you know, order to allow our, our medical uh, co community okay. to bring in the necessary medical equipment in order to, to treat and, con uh, and contain this deadly uh, epidemic. Uh, Mr. Nadari, uh, as far as the media r reports suggested, uh, earlier the U.S. president was trying to uh, suggest that all Iran needs to do is to ask the U.S. for help, uh, quote-unquote. Uh, is Iran going to do that? And what do you make of, I mean, Tehran, you're not representing the government, but what people think about the those so-called uh, offer of help uh, from your perspective? Well, both sides are doing this for domestic consumption. From here, they want to show themselves tough to the ordinary Iranians. On the other side, they want, the, the, the Trump administration officials are, are trying to tell their voters, look, we are trying to help the Iranian government and, and, and the people of Iran. We are not targeting the ordinary Iranians. So they are also doing it for domestic consumption. But at the end of the day, I, did, I think we need cooler heads cooler heads on both sides. I think that these two sides should come to their senses. They, sh they have no right to play with the well-being and, 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 and of, the, of the ordinary citizens. Mm -hmm. Public health. They should put aside their differences for the time being, at least for a, for a period of two or three months, and okay. lift the sanctions regime, and on the part of Iran to ask for help from the international community, including the U.S., in order to bring the situation under control. Yeah. After that, they are free to do whatever they want to do. Uh, Mr. Nadari, I understand your journalists are very passionate about your people. Let me ask you this. Uh, uh, the U.S. president was also earlier suggesting, oh, we have the best doctors, uh, and therefore we can send in the doctors. But the question really is, what does Iran need now? Is it about the test kits? Is it about medical supply? Or is it about a bunch of doctors? Uh, what uh, do, does Iran need now? Uh, from your reporting around Tehran and other cities, what is the latest situation? 
That's a good question. We needed uh, detection kits for the coronavirus. We didn't get it from Europe or America. We got it from, from China. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that we need. We have top, top doctors and, uh, and, and nurses. We don't need American nurses or doctors here. We need uh, the banking system to, to ease the, 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 the sanctions on Iran in order to purchase other things. We need medical equipment. We need uh, uh, sanitary items. We need yeah. also uh, basic goods and, and uh, and, and services from, the, from international markets. For that to happen, we need an easing of banking restrictions on Iran. I see. Uh, and, and another question before we go to invite the Chinese guests uh, into our discussion, uh, Mr. Nazari, is about the cultural and religious traditions. Now, I understand uh, one man who is trying to pose in a video which had been went going viral in Iran, you know, trying to kiss the, the handles of the door uh, to go defiant against the public health advice uh, about not to touch too much of public service, uh, sur surfaces and things like that, have been um, actually accused and also uh, arrested, if I understand. Uh, so, but, but, but the thing is, uh, some of the traditional and religious traditions uh, do not go hand in hand with the latest uh, health advice regarding this outbreak. So how do we see a society trying to negotiate within itself in a very time limited uh, area and in a very time limited matter? Well, the virus doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, know religion, border, or, or, or ethnic you know, background. It has nothing to do with these and everything to do with health, health, health. I think our, our religious leaders should also realize that this is a very serious situation. They also need to take some responsibility and, and tell the ordinary Iranians not to visit the holy shrines and holy sites for the time being and take care of themselves and their families. That's the message that we want also to hear from our religious leaders and they need to do that as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. As I told you, it is going to affect everybody here if they don't take the matter seriously. They need to take the matter seriously just like China and just like the rest of the international civil society, yeah. before it is too late. Uh, Mr. Nadari, stay with us. I, I, I can feel the passion you have for your country and your people at this critical moment. For now, let me bring in uh, on the phone Ambassador Hua Liming, the former Chinese ambassador uh, to Iran. Ambassador Hua, thank you for waiting. And please tell me your response to the words uh, just uh, being expressed by your Iranian counterpart. Um. I, I can understand Mr. Nadiri's uh, tensions because the Iranians are very concerned about the, the breakout of the uh, virus. Personally, I, I think I to, I'm totally sympathetic to the people of Iran and I'm very much concerned. Yeah about the situation in, in the world. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ambassador Hua, I understand a small team of Chinese doctors who have been having rich experience of fighting COVID-19 since its outbreak in China is now already in Iran and being interacting with the Chinese embassy and the also Iranian uh, health uh, personnel. Uh, anything that you can update us about and how do you think this kind of a, a collaboration and support could be? Uh, you see, China and Iran are strategic partners, and a very good strategic partners relationship has been established uh, four and five years before. And uh, I remember one month before when the breakout in China's Wuhan, uh, Iranian Foreign Minister Mr. Jawad Zarif was among the first foreign ministers who called the Chinese Foreign Minister to uh, express their uh, sympathy and their support uh, to China. And the, the, same, the, the same thing last Friday, uh, Mr. Wang Yi, Minister of Foreign Affairs of China, called uh, uh, Javad Zarif and uh, uh, expressed China's sympathy and China's support for, for Iranians and announced that China will send uh, 15,000 uh, testing kits to, to Iran and send some personals to, to Iran for consultations. Mm. Uh, I think that the four people now are in, in Iran. They are, um, they, although they are not working in the site, but they are giving very good consultations to our Iranian because uh, these people have very good experience in Wuhan. Mm. 
Uh, Ambassador Hua, we also noticed that Iran was one of the very first countries which sent uh, face masks to China during the very early stage of China's outbreak of COVID-19 and certainly demonstrated their friendship toward China. Now, is this uh, offer from China a return of friendship or is this uh, a continuity of uh, China's engagement with Iran? And how is this uh, also interact with other uh, common interests that the two countries have, uh, for example, economic interest, uh, for example, energy interest, uh, Ambassador Hua? Uh, of course, and China, uh, I think the whole nation of China is very sympathetic, to, uh, sympathetic and China can share uh, her uh, experience in Wuhan mm -hmm. with uh, Iran when the, 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 the problem, uh, the, the, the virus uh, breakouts in, in the cities of Iran. Yeah. Uh, Ambassador Hua, we have very limited time, but uh, uh, as a seasoned uh, analyst uh, uh, looking at the latest situation in Iran for a long time, uh, what would you suggest the international community to do, China included, of course, in this, uh, to help and support Iran to go through this very difficult time? I mean, the Iranian people, of course, we're talking about here. I think COVID-19 is a global disaster, and uh, no nation in the world can, could be immune mm. from the, this, uh, this disaster. So uh, all nations should work together, should uh, cooperate together to give up all kinds of uh, hostilities and yeah. uh, zero zero sum games, international games, yeah. and uh, let all the people, all nations can cooperate, including the U.S. and Iran. I don't think the U.S. and Iran are enemies in, in fighting against the, the COVID-19 virus, the, the energy problems, the banking system, uh, the, all should be yeah. uh, lifted against the Iran. Okay. I, if, if there is another virus in, in, in the world, I think for Iran, the biggest virus is U.S. sanctions. The sanctions should be lifted against Iran. Mm. And also, we want to invite back uh, Mr. Nadari, who has been listening. Your final words, sir, before we wrap up. Well, ju just as the way uh, the Iranians stood behind their, their Chinese counterparts in their darkest hours about one month ago. Now the Chinese people and the government are standing behind Iran. This is a huge relief for the Iranian community, for ordinary Iranians. And, and from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of millions of Iranians here, I would like to extend my gratitude and thank you to each and every one of you uh, back in China, especially the government okay. and especially the embassy of China here that worked around the clock in order to, to uh, import those detection kids to the capital and set, send, of course, medical staff to Iran to help with, with their experiences with us in order to contain the virus. So thank you very much. Well, thank you also very much, uh, Mr. Nadari. And also our, car, our hearts, of course, goes to the people in Iran. This is a global fight, so we all need to be together, not just China and Iran, but everybody on this earth. Uh, uh, this is not a slogan, it's a reality. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Gambar Nadari in Iran, and earlier on the phone, Ambassador Hua Limi. It was New Year's Eve 2019 when health officials in China admitted they had a problem. The health authorities have activated their most serious response level after an outbreak of a new type of viral pneumonia in central China. A rapidly growing number of people were developing a dry cough and fever before getting pneumonia. And for some, it turned fatal. Doctors have named the disease COVID-19, or Coronavirus Disease 2019, indicating that a type of virus is causing the illness. When they tried to trace its origin, they found a likely source, this food market in Wuhan. Out of the first 41 patients, 27 had been here. It wasn't conclusive evidence, but Chinese officials quickly shut down the market. They had seen this happen before, at a place just like this. The health officials are trying to get a grip on an alarming outbreak of SARS. The virus originated in mainland China. It spread across the country. The disease had been festering for months in southern China. In 2002, a coronavirus had emerged at a very similar market in southern China. 
It eventually reached 29 countries and killed nearly 800 people. Now, 18 years later, this coronavirus is in at least 71 countries and has already killed over 3,100 people. So what do these markets have to do with the coronavirus outbreak? And why is it happening in China? A lot of the viruses that make us sick actually originate in animals. Some of the viruses that cause the flu come from birds and pigs. HIV AIDS comes from chimpanzees. The deadly Ebola virus likely originates in bats. And in the case of the 2019 coronavirus, there's some evidence it went from a bat to a pangolin before infecting a human. While viruses are very good at jumping between species, it's rare for a deadly one to make this journey all the way to humans. That's because it would need all these hosts to encounter each other at some point. That's where the Wuhan market comes in. It's a wet market. A kind of place where live animals are slaughtered and sold for consumption. It was not a surprise at all, and I think that it was not a surprise to many scientists. Peter Lee is a professor and expert on China's animal trade. The cages stack above one over another. Animals at the bottom are often soaked with all kinds of liquid animal excrement, pus, blood, or whatever the liquid they're receiving from uh, the animals uh, above. That's exactly how a virus can jump from one animal to another. If that animal then comes in contact with or is consumed by a human, the virus could potentially infect them. And if the virus then spreads to other humans, it causes an outbreak. Wet markets are scattered all over the world, but the ones in China are particularly well known because they offer a wide variety of animals, including wildlife. This is a sample menu reportedly from the market in Wuhan. These animals are from all over the world, and each one has the potential to carry its own viruses to the market. The reason all these animals are in the same market is because of a decision China's government made decades ago. Back in the 1970s, China was falling apart. Famine had killed more than 36 million people, and the communist regime, which controlled all food production, was failing to feed its more than 900 million people. In 1978, on the verge of collapse, the regime gave up this control and allowed private farming. While large companies increasingly dominated the production of popular foods like pork and poultry, some smaller farmers turned to catching and raising wild animals as a way to sustain themselves. At the very beginning, it was mostly peasant household backyard operation of the turtles, for example. That's how wildlife farming started to get off the ground. And since it started to feed and sustain people, the Chinese government backed it. So it was imperative for the government to encourage people to you know, to make a living through whatever productive activities they can find themselves in. You can lift yourself out of poverty, no matter what you are doing, that's okay. But then in 1988, the government made a decision that changed the shape of wildlife trade in China. They enacted the Wildlife Protection Law, which designated the animals as resources owned by the state and protected people engaged in the utilization of wildlife resources. That's one of the most devastating problems of the law, because if you designate the wildlife as a natural resource, that means it is something you can use for human benefits. The law also encouraged the domestication and breeding of wildlife. And with that, an industry was born. Small local farms turned into industrial-sized operations. For example, this bear farm started with just three, and eventually grew to more than a thousand bears. Bigger populations meant greater chances that a sick animal could spread disease. Farmers were also raising a wide variety of animals, which meant more viruses on the farms. Nonetheless, these animals were funneled into the wet markets for profit. While this legal wildlife farming industry started booming, it simultaneously provided cover for an illegal wildlife industry. Endangered animals like tigers, rhinoceroses, and pangolins were trafficked into China. By the early 2000s, these markets were teeming with wild animals when the inevitable happened. The latest on the deadly SARS virus, the worldwide death toll, up again today. China has reported more than 1,400 cases of infection nationwide. It is what health officials have feared all along. In 2003, the SARS outbreak was traced to a wet market here in southern China. Scientists found traces of the virus in farmed civet cats. Chinese officials quickly shut down the markets and banned wildlife farming. 
But just a few months after the outbreak, the Chinese government declared 54 species of wildlife animals, including civet cats, legal to farm again. By 2004, the wildlife farming industry was worth an estimated 100 billion won, and it exerted significant influence over the Chinese government. Wildlife farming industry was tiny in China's gigantic GDP, but the industry has enormous lobbying capability. It's because of this influence that the Chinese government has allowed these markets to grow over the years. In 2016, for example, the government sanctioned the farming of some endangered species, like tigers and pangolins. By 2018, the wildlife industry had grown to 148 billion won and had developed clever marketing tactics to keep the markets around. The industry has been promoting you know, these wildlife animals as, you know, tonic products, as, you know, bodybuilding, as sex enhancing, and of course as disease fighting. None of the claims can hold water. Yet these products became popular with an influential portion of China's population. The majority of the people in China do not uh, eat wildlife animals. Those people who consume these wildlife animals are the rich and the powerful, a small Minority. It's this minority that the Chinese government chose to favor over the safety of the rest of its population. These parochial commercial interests of small number of wildlife eaters are hijacking China's national interest. Soon after the coronavirus outbreak, the Chinese government shut down thousands of wet markets and temporarily banned wildlife trade again. Organizations around the world have been urging China to make the ban permanent. Chinese social media, in particular, has been flooded with petitions to ban it for good this time. In response, China is reportedly amending the wildlife protection law that encouraged wildlife farming decades ago. But unless these actions lead to a permanent ban on wildlife farming, outbreaks like this one are bound to happen again. For a bunch more information about China's wet markets, viruses, and wildlife, we have an episode on our Netflix show called The Next Pandemic Explained. It talks about why a coronavirus could spark the next pandemic and what the world's experts are doing to stop it. That's on our Netflix show Explained. Check it out. An Iranian politician has died after contracting the coronavirus, as health authorities there reported 21 new deaths over the past 24 hours. It brings the total number of fatalities in Iran to 145, while nearly 6,000 infections have been confirmed across the country. But Iran's mosque authority has postponed all group prayers and gatherings until further notice. Let's go live now to the Iranian capital, Tehran. Al Jazeera Zain Basravi is there. Zain, uh, tell us about some of the challenges, the greatest challenges that are affecting Iranians right now. Well, it has to be said that one of the biggest problems the government is facing while trying to address this, while trying to control the spread, while trying to stop the spread and treat those that have contracted the coronavirus, is getting the public on board with guidance to restrict their movements. And really, that is the compounding problem here in Iran. There are really two tracks here. There is the health ministry trying to control the illness, trying to deal with the spread of this virus, and the economy of the country. And really, if they don't want to bring the country to a standstill, uh, placing mass quarantines on cities and towns, uh, bringing the country to a standstill will definitely hurt the economy. So the government is really caught between what, how to address the health crisis and how to keep the country from bringing, uh, coming to a total standstill. The health ministry, uh, uh, during the public briefing today, said that it is considering severe restrictions on people's travel, on people's movement. That's compounding what they said yesterday, which is that they could use force to keep people from moving between cities, to keep people even from moving inside their own cities. But when you're out on the streets, you see that there are still people going about their day, they're going to work, they're, they're going to their shops, they're opening their doors to customers. And really that's because Iranians, if they stop working, the economy is already struggling so much that any sort of hit economically to people's uh, home incomes, to their, to their, uh, to their uh, income on a daily basis, 
could be catastrophic, and that could create this in, in, instability of a different kind. Uh, the Interior Ministry today, uh, taking a decision that seems to contradict what the health ministry is trying to do, announcing that all government jobs will go back to normal uh, later this week. People will begin working normal hours once again. Uh, this while Khum, the city where this outbreak was first detected, uh, the number of cases there continues to rise. Today, the city is on lockdown as government workers sanitize city streets. And during the health ministry briefing, uh, Mr. Namaki, Said Namaki said that we are dissatisfied with people who are not heeding government advice. We were forced to tighten quarantines inside cities and towns and prevent people not from those cities and towns from entering certain provinces. He's also asked people to cancel any sort of large ceremonies or weddings during the period of this crisis. Al Jazeera Zain Basrabi reporting live there from Tehran. Zain, many thanks indeed. Meanwhile,